I spent 72 hours in a place that doesn't exist. We arrived at midnight. I tasted salt and the bitter flavor of medication as the woman in the back of the ambulance unbuckled me from the stretcher. You good? She asked gently, but I didn't reply back. Can you please hold your hands behind your back? With a deadened gaze, I complied with her orders. The dull thud of a distant Ramstein song swam in and out of my brain like a swarm of locusts. I thought it was in my head, but the ambulance driver switched off the radio and the song had stopped. I shuffled down and the sidewalk toward the rear door of the mental hospital, and the woman accompanied me, gripping my shoulder with caution, but of the utmost firmness. A nurse had opened the door and the man spoke with her briefly. I wasn't really paying attention. I unfocused my eyes and stared out of the towering skeletal trees that loomed over the edge of the sidewalk. My parents had called me earlier. If I did all the right things, I could go home in 72 hours. All I had to do was eat, sleep, and go to therapy. They said they were sorry. They said they wanted to see me again. When the nurse opened the door wider, she invited me in with the kind of grimace smile that people do when they drive over a roadkill. The first thing they did was the regular procedural test. A gray-haired doctor beckoned me into a small room in the hall. His name tag was turned the wrong way, so I couldn't read it. He passed me a lavender hospital gown. Please change, and then I need to take your blood. I nodded bleakly. At the time, I didn't think much of it, but he watched me attentively as my trembling hands fumbled with my clothes, and he didn't let me keep any of my clothes except my shirt. I had strings in my jacket and sweatpants, and I guess you could hang yourself with them, or strangle yourself or others. I averted my eyes as he began to numb the inner joint of my elbow. You can close your eyes now, he muttered. Instead, I watched unblinking as the dark blood ran up the narrow tube. It looked back in the fluorescent light. The doctor stared at it greedily, examining the slick contents as they gathered in a small glass container. Then he put a little white band around my wrist with my name, my medication, and my doctor on it. There was a lot of fucked up stuff going on there, but first things first, I guess. Our rooms were kind of dark even in the daytime because the window was all blurred out so we couldn't see outside. Every now and then, though, the ambulance would bring in a new person and the blurred window would light up like fireworks on a summer night and a vivid red and blue danced all over our floor. My roommates said they looked very pretty. I had three roommates, to be exact. I'll call them Natalie, Diane, and Rachel. Natalie was sleeping when I arrived since it was late. I was afraid they'd be psycho, but the other two were actually pretty alright. Both of them were in the hospital for anger management. Diane fought a lot at school and Rachel had threatened to kill her mom. They told me that Natalie was there because of drug addiction, which is kind of sad because she was the youngest. The first night was sort of fun. We filled in the cracks in the wall with toothpaste and peeled the stickers off our wristbands and put them on our wall over our beds. I've been here four times. Rachel claimed with satisfaction. I like to leave my mark. She pointed to the ceiling where her name had been written with a shaky, dull pencil. All the pencils at the hospital were really dull. You can probably guess why. The stuff that sucked the most were the weird rules, like no walking in the hallways after 10, no touching other patients, and you couldn't even use the restrooms to brush your teeth or even wash your face unless a nurse was watching you. It also sucked in all the usual ways. The shower water was cold, we washed our bodies with what looked like hand soap, and we could only go outside for a half an hour a day. Everything ran on a tight schedule. You woke up at a certain time, you ate at a certain time, and you went to about all the usual activities at a certain time. Rachel explained everything to me. Visiting hours were at 2 in the afternoon, if you were lucky to even have visitors. Most visitors were only able to see you and be there for about 20 minutes before they were moved, and other visitors cycled in. If you wanted to talk to someone outside of those hours, you could use the hall phones, but only for 10 minutes, and your call was heavily monitored. The first time I called my parents was when I met Lily. There she is! Natalie grabbed my elbow and nodded subtly toward a girl at the end of the hall. Rachel said she's been here for at least three weeks, probably longer. 
I didn't even know they could keep us for that long, she whispered back to me. I nodded. What's wrong with her? I whispered back. I think she's got, like, schizophrenia or something. When Rachel got her a few weeks ago, she was pretty okay, but then she got juiced and had to go to the white room. Now, the white room was the word we used for the last room at the end of the hall. Uh, it's like solitary confinement, except more for 15-year-old kids who shoot heroin instead of serial killers. As one might assume from the name, the whole room is, of course, entirely white, and the door doesn't have a window in it like the others do. We know it's white because they leave it open in the morning so Lily can go get her clothes and stuff. And, of course, there's only one bed in there, right in the middle of the room, like a lonely marble altar. I think I'd go crazy, too, if I was in the white room. Anyway, I digress. On the first morning, I was calling my parents on the hall phone. I cried a lot when I heard my mom's voice, which sucked because Natalie was standing next to me and had to pretend she didn't see what my nose was all runny and I was making those little weird hiccuping breaths that you make when you try to hold back your tears. It was sort of okay though, considering some tall guy next to me was crying too. Midway through my call, Lily started shrieking at the top of her lungs from a chair stationed outside of her room. She looked me dead in the eyes and she screamed, Tell them to get us out of here, this is hell, this is hell. A nurse rested his hand on her shoulder and she nimbly sprung up. Lily's voice was all slow and drugged up, sort of like she was a gargling molasses. Don't, don't fucking touch me. Then, quieter, she mumbled. Please, I just want to go home. Please, just take me home. The nurse tried to hush her yet again, and this time she sat down and started giggling to herself manically. Lily just likes to yell to scare the callers. Don't worry about it, the nurse assured. Who's screaming? Are you okay? My mom pelted me with questions from the other end of the line. Of course, I hung up. Visiting hours went okay. I saw Rachel leave in the hall and gather up all her stuff. She waved at me through the door and the window. Her grandma's arms were wrapped tightly around her waist. I felt kind of rotten, like acid inside me just dissolving everything away and I'd just be a husk with skin that would collapse on itself. My mom told me to be good and that she wasn't mad at me anymore. I just said, all right, to all of her questions and left. Then it was outside time. There was a courtyard in the middle of the facility with a basketball hoop, a vending machine, and a few benches. I was looking forward to see trees or grass, but there wasn't any. The adult ward is over there, Natalie said, jabbing a thumb at the, at the opposite side of the courtyard. A locked door with a window set into it was the only boring thing interrupting the great walls. Want to go check it out? I eagerly agreed. We stood up on a bench and looked through the little window in the door. Now, the adult hallways were pitch black. I didn't really know what I was expecting to see, but that definitely wasn't it. Why didn't they keep the lights on during the day? The sunlight streamed in through the tiny window and left a bright rectangle on the ground inside, like a white tile. We watched for no more than half a minute, but nothing happened. No movement, nothing. Natalie hopped down from the bench and went to play basketball, and I turned my head to look away when motion caught the corner of my eye. An old lady ambled down the adult's hall. Her hair was silk white and caught the slightest bit of light from the window. Then, the impossible happened. Her pace quickened abruptly and she scrambled as she launched herself toward that little bit of light on the ground and the instant before she entered the sunlight I saw her face. Skinless. It was a contorted mess, as if someone had just taken a knife and just peeled her skin back ever so slightly. As if it was molded by somebody who doesn't quite know what a human face should even look like. But before I could even look away, she was in the light. Now her face is normal wrinkled and haggard, but no different than somebody's grandmother. She walked away and out of sight. And my stomach was feeling bad before it was twisting itself into knots now. I tried to play it off, but Natalie and I climbed on top of the vending machine when the supervisor was gone. We were trying to see the tops of the trees. For some reason, all we saw was a drab, sickly yellow sky. 
I wondered where all the trees went because I remembered seeing them all lined up next to the sidewalk. That night was bad. When we came back from dinner, we heard a massive crash. Diane had punched a gaping, jagged hole through the window. When I turned the light on in our room, Diane was just standing there, barefoot, clutching her fist, with the floor covered in shards of glass. She didn't even meet my eyes. She walked right through the glass shards as if it were nothing, then up to the nurse's office. Now, at this point, my hands were trembling so much that I thought my veins would burst. I wasn't watching Diane. I was watching the window. Instead of trees or ambulances or buildings outside through that broken window, I saw an empty, empty space. It's sort of hard to describe now that I'm trying to find the right words for it. I, when I was a kid, my mom used to breed mealworms to feed to our chameleons. Now, the empty space looked like the mealworms in that dish, kind of, but dark and fast instead of pale and lethargic. The darkness pulsated almost. For some reason, all I could think of was the worms before a nurse pulled me back into the hall and sent me into an empty room. I didn't say anything after that. I just waited in the group room until they told me and Natalie to move into a different room for the night. Diane went into the white room. I don't know where Lily went that night. The nurses gathered us all up in a group and told us that we couldn't go out and walk around, especially tonight because something was going on. It got in. It's inside now, Lily told me. The nurse next to her shot her a pensive look, so I pretended that I didn't even hear it, and I just kept scribbling on the table with a super dull pencil. I don't like the group room. It made me depressed, because they'd hang up all the kids' drawings and writings and stuff, and some of them would say sad shit like, don't let your mom tell you you're worthless, or you don't need drugs. I thought it was kind of ironic considering that the facility was the ones giving us drugs in the first place. I mean, practically for everything. After that night, all the events kind of got out of order and jumbled up, but like when you put a puzzle together and it fits, but it's still the wrong piece anyway. Speaking of which, on the second morning, I got really, really sick. Earlier, the nurses had given me some kind of medication the night before, so I'd sleep easier after the whole trauma involving Diane. Thinking about Diane and the white room made me just feel even more sick. I threw up a lot, black, sticky stuff. It was disgusting. Natalie wanted to see my vomit because I told her that it was super weird, but the nurse said only one person could be in the restroom at a time. So she just waited outside while I kept hacking up the nasty stuff. During visiting hours, both of my parents came in this time. I tried talking to them more so they know I was okay, but they seemed a little out of it too. I asked them to bring me my clothes so I wouldn't have to wear the hospital gown. It kind of got cold at night. They told me they'd bring me some tomorrow. I asked how my Anna, my sister, was doing, and they just stared at me blankly. Oh, she's doing fine, my mother finally managed. Is she winning? I asked eagerly. Anna was really good at volleyball, and she was playing a tournament today, actually. Winning what? My mom inquired, distracted as she studied me. It was a calculating stare, the kind that the teacher gives you in middle school when they know you have to answer but aren't raising your hand anyway. The tournament. Yeah, of course. Yeah, she, she's pretty okay. I was relieved when visiting hours were over. My parents looked really sick and sad. It was difficult to bear. My mom's face was pale and almost swollen while my dad's eyes were sunken and feverish. Diane, of course, didn't come to visiting hours. A nurse was the one that found Diane. She was hanging from the curtain rod in the showers. She tied a few sheets together to do it, I think, but that's just what another girl told me. I didn't see the whole thing go down, and since it happened right after I went to bed, but Natalie was still up and she said she saw them rush Diane's body out. The doctors held a group session and they said they didn't know if Diane would make it, but we should send our best wishes to her anyway and use her as an example of what happens when you're victim to the intrusive voices inside your head. That was kind of a creepy way of talking about intrusive thoughts, but I guess the doctor was right. For some reason, it sounds awful, but I couldn't bring myself to feel anything for Diane. Yeah, I felt pretty bad for her, but I thought that I should have felt something more. 
I told the doctor and he said it wasn't bad, it was just the shock. He smiled at me really sympathetically, but it looked like the sort of smile a wife gives their husband after they lace their tea with cyanide. The sort that doesn't reach her eyes, so I didn't smile back. The next day was my last day, and of course it was the worst. I woke up late and skipped breakfast. I didn't take the medication that they gave me. I just hid it under my tongue and spat it out in the trash when I got back into my room. The flavor it left was kind of bittersweet, a mixture of grape, cough syrup, and dirt. There were tiny, withering worms in the trash can when I checked later, like that little white pill with some disgusting egg. I told the nurse and they brought it a new trash can. I didn't even think about Diane. All I could think about was the worms and how gross it was that I might have swallowed them the other day. Now, my parents only visited for a little bit this time. They chatted with me briefly, but then pulled out the clothes they'd brought me. It was really odd because I couldn't recognize any of the clothing as my own. I thought maybe I was going a little crazy, but then my mom showed me this old-fashioned white dress, and I knew for sure that I'd never owned a dress like that in my life. It had all of these suspicious looking stains on it too. Not blood stains, but like grass stains as if they dug it up from somewhere. I took the dress, but I stuffed it into my drawer with the other clothes that definitely weren't mine and kept wearing the hospital gown. Everything progressed and pretty normally. Natalie went home late in the afternoon and she seemed really excited about it. I was sad to see her go because now I was in the room all by myself. Lily had taken up residence in the white room again. Everything was back to how it was before, except I was super bored and lonely and tired. I wasted time watching the nurses through the little door window for a while. Sometimes their faces would swim in and out of my vision, but I never managed to remember any of them or recognize any of their faces. It was like they were shifting, as if they were a million people working at the facility, and you never got to the same ones twice. That's really what started to bother me on the final evening. The nurses made new faces for themselves, I was sure of it, just like the old lady in the adult ward. I don't know why it took me so long to realize it, but everything was so foreign at first. And the nurses were the last thing I was thinking of. Everything started going downhill when a nurse came in before dinner and told me to take my medication. I know you didn't take it, she said firmly. It's not so bad, you know. Just down it with water. See how small it is? Her fingers unfurled like tendrils revealing the oblong white egg pill. I don't need it, it makes me sick, I insisted in reply. Okay, suit yourself, but you'll have to take it later, she reported, marching off. I know she put that ugly smooth pill on my food. I just know it. That night, I was vomiting again, but instead of Natalie waiting in the door over the restroom, the nurse watched me intently as I choked up what little food I'd eaten in the past two days. I could hear Lily screaming from far away like she did every night when it started getting darker, and I shuddered. We all pretended to ignore it, but I know everyone else heard it too. That was the exact moment when I decided to make a run for it. When the nurse closed the door to lead me outside to the restroom, I slammed my hands against her shoulders, toppling her and pressing past her. With ridiculous speed for a woman of her age, she grabbed my wrist with an iron grip. Her hand clutched my wristband and it slipped off. Sprinting away as adrenaline ran through my veins like motor oil, I opened the door to the adult ward and already knew that I was lost. Hallways stretched on either end, which way I had entered. There was no way the facility was this big. I took a sharp right turn and was met with a dead end door. The nurse was still pursuing me. <clears throat> uh, I opened the door with manic fury and slammed it closed behind me, panting. It only took me a moment for my eyes to adjust. I wasn't alone. Scattered across the floor, about a dozen bodies lay in a neat array. A few of their faces I recognized. A girl who'd left on my first day, Natalie, and Diane, who had been propped up against the wall, as if she were sitting down. They were organized in rows, as if it were in a kindergarten and learning how to count. The stench of rot filled my nostrils and my brain boiled with nausea. The corpses just festered in the human fume of decay. The white worms were everywhere. They devoured the walls, covered the floor. The entire space beat to the heart of the worms, a rancid collective of long, pale threads. The little room was like a cage full of oily rat carcasses. 
The girl's hair had glistened in the half-light coming from a window on the other side of the room. The moment I heard the door open behind me, I took off for the window and leapt, slamming my heels to the glass as it gave under my weight. My eyes were shut tightly, blood ran down my leg, but I wasn't sure where it was coming from. I looked back up at the window, but there was no window. There was no window, no room, no facility. Trees farmed an empty lot, basking in the dim glow of the yellow street lamps. I checked the time on my watch. It was midnight. My family still doesn't believe this story, and honestly, I don't blame them. I've stopped believing it, too, to some extent. Luckily, I'm safe now, and I wandered the street for a while and a daze until somebody called the police. I had a nasty cut on my knee from the glass, and the doctor said that there was glass in my hair and my palms, but they don't know how it got there. My parents claimed they never visited me and that I'd never been to that hospital. They said I was just missing one night, that there was no suicide attempt, no ambulance, no mental hospital, but, but I know better. In the back of my mind, I remember it all so clear that it can't possibly have been a dream. My every waking moment is still haunted by those faceless nurses and the worms. Oh god, the fucking worms. I still see them everywhere. I think that's why I'm writing this. I, I want to remember what happened, and I, I don't remember what happened. I just, I want to remember that it was real. Relax, son. Close one eye and keep focused on your target. My father spoke calmly from behind me. I tried to do as he had said, letting my muscles relax. One eye closed, ending the double vision I had from having the rifle sight so close to my gaze. That's good, he continued. Now, when you're ready, hold your breath. Don't hold it for too long or you're gonna start shaking. Just enough. Then, slowly squeeze the trigger down, like you're milking a cow. I had to chuckle at that. Dad, I've never milked a cow before. I spoke as I glanced up to him. He furrowed a brow and adjusted the baseball cap on his head. Well, that's how my dad described it to me. You know what I mean. I smiled a bit and shook my head. It wasn't the first time my dad described how to shoot to me, or the second, or even the third. He tended to repeat himself sometimes. I don't mind though. I looked back to the target through the sight and concentrated. I still took everything he said in. I relaxed, letting muscles loosen just enough. I shut one eye, focusing on that bull's eyes down at the end of the barrel. My breath held in my throat and slowly, I squeezed down the trigger. The rifle jumped in my hands, jerking heavily as it bounced back. My head jerked backwards a bit, uneasy of the weapon as it leapt up. I was still a bit nervous since the last time I went to the range and the scope smacked me in my eye, bruising and cutting my brow. I couldn't see from where we stood at the shooting range station, but I felt good about the shot. My dad leaned in to the spotting scope we had set up and looked through it. A small nod and I saw a smile curl upon his lips. Not bad, take a look. I rose up and shift to look through the scope myself. It took a bit of moment to focus through it before I could see the small, black hole in the target down at the other end of the range. It wasn't a bullseye, being just a bit high and to the left of the center. My dad nodded and placed a hand on my shoulder. If that was a deer, it'd be a clean hit. I smiled at his words and turned back to him. You think I actually have a shot at hitting something this weekend? He shrugged his shoulders and then let out a breath. It's possible, he said. Well, sure as hell try. Now, see if you can actually hit the bullseye this time. I chuckled and shook my head. And back to the station I went. I lift the rifle up and focused again. Maybe, with a bit of luck, we might come back with something on this hunting trip. That'd be a change. I haven't shot since the day at the rifle range. I wasn't too worried, though. Apparently, I was a pretty decent shot. No bullseyes though, but hey, close enough really. 
and I was getting used to the 30 odd short mag browning rifles my dad got for us to use. They packed a hell of a kick, but with the padded stocks and a firm grip, you could keep them pretty well under control. My dad had been planning this trip for quite a while and got the two Brownings specifically for it. The plan was that my dad, my uncle John, and I... <clears throat> the plan was that my dad, my uncle John, and I, John, would head up this out in the middle of nowhere place where my dad used to deer hunt with his father and do the same for the weekend. To be honest, I wasn't really big on the whole outdoors thing. It meant being too hot in the day and too cold at night, bugs everywhere, and constant overwhelming feeling of needing a shower, but I wanted to do it for my dad. My father, Fred, wasn't doing all that hot. Recently, he had cancer and a severe case of vasculitis. It really knocked him down a few pegs. A couple of years ago, I remember a strong and fearless man who could make someone back down with a hard stare. Now, he was immensely different, a former shadow of himself, a lot skinnier and he'd had the look of a man who had stared real death in the face. It rattled him to the core and made me realize that I may not have as much time as I thought with this man. Probably what my uncle was thinking as well. John wasn't my dad's brother, but actually my mother's. He was a bit more of the city type, like me. He taught at one of the local high schools and delved into a number of random hobbies. Lately, it had been photography. Even as we drove up, I could see that they had a fancy new Nikon DSLR camera set about his neck on the strap. We brought three guns with us, the two Brownings and my dad's old 30 out 30 rifle, but we didn't expect John to shoot anything unless it was with his camera. I figured the only real reason my dad brought along his 30 odd 30 was because of the nostalgia rather than for all of us to shoot. It was the gun he used with his father and he kept it as if it was brand new. Even with the proper care and maintenance though, it was still rather old and the new Brownings were much more solid. He even got them set up with brand new scopes and shoulder straps, the whole works. If a deer came across our path, we'd have the gear to take it down there. We arrived at our hunting ground in the afternoon. It was a few hours from where we lived and then another hour driving along a dirt and gravel road. That was the most boring part of the trip. The car couldn't go more than 15 miles per hour on the road with all the bumps and dips. Finally, we had reached out spot which turned out to be a bit of a clearing in the middle of a large grouping of trees. I don't remember the exact location, but just that it took quite a ways to get there. We set up our camp, just a large single tent for us three, and unpacked some of our gear. John had made sure to grab some of that nice camping cook gear, and my dad had pre-cooked some ribs and chicken that we'd just have to warm up. So the first thing we did after setting up was eat. So Fred, John began as we munched on some ribs. What are the odds of uh, getting a deer out here? As good as anyone else's, my dad shrugged. There was a bit of a pause before John spoke again. Let's say we get a deer. Then what do we do then? John quirked a brow as he focused on my father. It seemed an innocent question, but I knew where it was going. The question meant, if we got a deer, how did we plan on taking care of the heavy thing in the middle of the brush? Or, more specifically, how did my dad plan on taking care of it? John's a good guy, but he might have been overly concerned for my dad. My dad lost a lot of his strength in the hospital, but he wasn't feeble yet, and my father hated it when people thought he was. We'll lug it up and carry it back here, he spoke shortly, a bit of annoyance slipping into his voice. David can handle it, right son? He asked me with a bit of a smile. I returned it with one of my own, and I nodded. Yeah, I can take care of it. I'm stronger than I look. My dad's smile only grew, and John just shrugged his shoulders. We finished soon after, and the sun was starting to show the first signs of it beginning to sink down toward the horizon. You know, we'll have a couple of hours before it gets dark, Dad said as he gazed up at the sky. You want to take a bit of a walk and see if we get lucky? Sure, I replied. Why not? John nodded in agreement, and soon the three of us were trudging off into the trees. 
Only Dad and I carried our guns, both of us wielding brand new Brownings. John was content just having his camera by his side. Dad moved on through the thin path, leading the way as he seemed to recall memories of himself and his father. I trudged along behind him, my rifle slung about my shoulder. John had the rear, his hands lingering near his camera. Every once in a while, I'd hear a soft click as he'd shoot a picture of some sort of eye-catching scenery while we walked by. We didn't find much, though. No deer, and hell, we didn't even see any animals except random birds and the hordes of bugs. I was starting to get tired and my legs began to hurt. It had been a long day, and I wanted nothing more than to go sit down and relax a bit before conking out. The cold started to set in as the sun sunk lower, nipping at me even through my jacket. Dad pushed on before he stopped and bent down. Find something? I asked as John and I both came up and looked down at the ground. My dad pointed out something in the soft dirt. A set of cloven tracks pressed on through the dirt, running along the path for a bit. Deer tracks. He smiled a bit and rose, carefully moving to follow them along the path. They go along here and then, he tailed off as he furrowed a brow and crouched back down to the ground. Then, I asked as John and I approached. Dad, once again, pointed to the ground. We could see what he was looking at. The prints suddenly shift and seem to move toward the forest off the path. But that's not what was unusual. There were two more footprints in the dirt next to the deer's and pointed in the direction the deer ran off in. That a bear? John asked my dad while he focused on those two prints in the earth. I thought they might be from a bear myself, but they looked odd. My dad noticed it too. Bear prints have a distinct shape where the paw lands in the dirt with five toes, though you might miss the little one depending on how the bear was moving. These prints had only three toes and an elongated print where the base of the paw fell, and the claw marks above those three toes dug deep into the ground. It almost seemed like if you gave a person three toes instead of five and threw on some thick, deadly claws, that he'd make his footprint. And the size of them didn't make me feel at all comfortable looking at them. Not the right shape, Dad finally spoke as he stood. And it's not a mountain lion either. Hmm. Uh, Bigfoot? I asked with a bit of, of a nervous chuckle. I tried to lighten the darkening mood. Well... They say he could be out here, Dad remarked with a bit of a grin, though I could tell he was only joking back with me to raise the mood as well. All three of us could feel it, an uneasiness that was starting to set in. A chill had ran through me as I stared at those prints, and not from the cold. Maybe we should call it a day, but you know, before it gets dark, John suggested. Nobody argued. We turned around and began to move back down toward the path. I kept a hand up on the shoulder strap of the rifle, ready to slip it off if I needed to. I noticed my father was doing the exact same thing. We didn't say much when we got back. John started a fire before it got too dark and the three of us sat around it for a little while as the night fell. It actually seemed rather peaceful. I could hear the light chirps of crickets in the woods and even the flutter of some of the nighttime bird flying by. Light chat began to start up again and we found ourselves forgetting about those weird prints. John and my father spoke about random things like the shows they watched on TV or the memories my dad had of the area. I sat back and just relaxed. Even though I was a city boy, it was nice to get out with my family and I could tell my father was really enjoying himself. He just seemed fuller, much more alive. Maybe the memories of good times were helping him recover. I hope that makes some more helped him too. I hope that making some more memories would help him too. We went to bed not long after that. John put out the fire and the dark night fell over the camp and only the stars and moon shedding enough light for us to get comfortable in the tent. As I drifted off to sleep in my sleeping bag, I noticed one thing though. Maybe I was just too tired to really care or that my mind forced me to ignore it, but it seemed strange when the sounds of the forest seemed to stop entirely. The crickets ended their song and the shifting of a hidden nocturnal animal's end. 
The crickets ended their song and the shifting of hidden, nocturnal animals had ended. I could feel a familiar uneasiness building back up in my stomach as sleep claimed me. The same feeling I had when we all gazed upon the strangely shaped tracks with claws that seemed to sink deep in the earth below. I woke up from a dreamless sleep to a smell that flew in and hit me right in my core. Bacon. Bacon. I rose from my sleeping bag, slipping on a new set of clothes and moved outside of the tent. John stood at the camping fryer he got, frying up a fresh batch of bacon while my dad double checked the guns, making sure they were all ready for today's trek. Morning, David, John spoke with a grin as he held up the pan. Almost done here. I got some eggs, too. Oh, bacon and eggs in the woods? I wasn't complaining. We ate breakfast happily, joking around a bit and fantasizing about all the different ways we were going to cook the deer, and we were sure to nab it on this trip. Last night's weirdness was completely forgotten at this point. After breakfast, we cleaned up and Dad handed me one of the brownings. You ready, son? He asked with a bit of a smile, and I nodded and I took the rifle before slinging it over my shoulder. Oh yeah, be good to get an early start this time too, Dad. Both father and son had readied their weapons as John made sure that his camera was fully set for the day. He even snapped a photo of the two of us, grinning at the camera. It felt good. It had been a while since my father and I had gotten a chance to really do something together. The time in the hospital had been long and stressful, and I still remember walking into his room, seeing him hooked up to all those machines with this look that screamed help me, but I couldn't do a damn thing. And before that, we've had a bit of a rough patch. Just stupid years of me being a dumb teenager, leading up into being a dumb young adult, and now I felt closer to him than ever. I felt like we were building up the family again, and I'll never forget that feeling. Then we strode off into the wild. Dad on point and John taking up our rear. We moved along the path again, our eyes peeled for anything moving in the woods and ears listening for just the slightest sound. Overall, it was a quiet morning that led into a quiet afternoon. We walked and moved and climbing over fallen trees that had obscured the path or slipping through overgrown areas where the plants worked to reclaim areas that man and animal, but mostly animal, had trudged through. I admit, I was starting to get bored and tired. You can only walk so long and not see anything before you get a bit dispirited. Dad didn't show any signs of exhaustion though. Even after getting out of the hospital this soon, he moved like he had a purpose. I figured we'd eventually come across a tree a bit too large or an overgrown patch a bit too thick, but he moved on through without a word or complaint at all. It turned out to be worth it all. We stopped as my dad held up a hand, both John and I halting in awkward poses as we immediately put our feet down mid-walk. In the distance, it took me a moment to see what he was looking at. It was hard to make out through the brush and trees, but I could see the light brown form of a deer. It stood off in the distance, through the trees, lightly grazing on something on the ground, and with our luck, it was a buck. Two sets of large antlers rose from its head tall and proud before they broke off into two branches apiece. A forked horn, my dad would call it. It didn't seem to see us yet, or smell us, or even sense us. My dad looked at me and gave me a grin as a handed motion to the rifle on my shoulder. You want to take the shot, son? He whispered to me. My hand lingered on the rifle before I slipped it off. The gun felt heavy in my hands, but then much heavier at the range. The shot seemed so far and the brush was all over. N no I said as I shook my head. A bit of embarrassment was flooding over me. You do it, Dad. I, I don't know if I could hit it that far away. He hesitated, but nodded as he turned back. Unslinging his own rifle and raising it up, I was hoping he wouldn't have been disappointed that I couldn't take the shot. I, I just didn't want to ruin this moment by missing. We finally come across the deer and I screw it up by failing at my shot. Dad would get it though. I knew it. He looked about and I could almost see him silently cursing himself. He was looking for a place to balance his rifle on, because right now there wasn't anywhere very convenient. You always want to make sure to steady your rifle. He drilled that fact into me. Shooting standing up with no rest was the worst way to do it. You only need to do it if you have to. 
and if you have to, at least remember everything else. You'll need every advantage to hit something without any kind of rest. My dad ended up moving to sit down on his rear in the dirt, his knees raising up. That way wasn't as good as finding a rest for your gun, but you can use your knees to steady both your back elbow and your front as you aimed. The deer's head rose and began to look about. Our welcome was thinning with it. Dad aimed down the sight and I heard him taking a short breath, not daring to let it out. His finger slowly fell upon the trigger. The shot rang out and I saw the bug jerk and stumble in the distance. It staggered for a moment and then burst off in a sprint through the trees, away from us. My dad rose and lifted his head, looking after it. John and I finally made our moves and stepped up to him. You get it, Fred? John asked as he looked off in the distance. I don't think you got it. Oh, I got it, Dad said with a confident smirk on his face. I got him. He looked to me and I smiled back. The deer seemed like it was hit, but I couldn't tell. I'd rather think my dad got him than missed. Should we go after it? I spoke as I looked off to the spot the deer had been in. Oh yeah. Dad replied as he began to push on, rifle slung back over his shoulder. It couldn't have gone far. And so, through the brush we went, the three of us searching for the wounded deer. When we came across the spot it had lingered in, the result was clear. A fresh patch of blood had covered a nearby tree and splashed the dirt on the ground. My dad just grinned and said, I told you so, look over to my uncle before he took a few steps. Sure enough, in the direction the deer ran off in, another splash of blood had stained the earth below. Got him, my dad said with a triumphant pump of a fist. Now, let's get him back. He's not going to be too far, I bet. The blood trail led on for a good distance. At times, there were sections where I lost the trail completely. I couldn't tell if we took a wrong turn or if the deer had maybe stopped bleeding. My dad kept right on it, and sure enough, we'd find a new splash of brownish red that mixed in with the dirt. The trail led straight to a large overgrown set of brush that appeared trampled and squished, like something hard fell upon it. A large pool of blood lay splattered over those plants and sunk into the earth below them. It seemed like the clear idea was that the deer had staggered here and then collapsed onto this brush. But no deer. Only the blood and torn up plants indicated that something heavy and bleeding had fallen here. My dad once again adjusted the ball cap on his head and moved up to investigate. That's weird. Looks like he should be right here. He commented as he ran a hand along the bloody leaves of the plant. I don't think he could have gotten up and after falling with a hit like that. John and I stepped forward to look as well. It didn't seem like something had fallen here. It had to have been the deer. What else was recently wounded and bleeding? John was the first to notice something strange. He had moved around the back of the brush and found an area behind it trampled to the ground. Blood streaked along the leaves and the ground below moving off into the woods, like something was being dragged. John waved my dad over, who took a look with a thoughtful gaze. You think something took off with it? John questioned my dad. Maybe, but this quick, it just doesn't seem possible. Dad sighed and shook his head. I stood back, both curious and nervous, the memory of a certain set of footprints coming back into my head. Let's take a look, John suggested after a moment. It shouldn't be too far. Curiosity must have got the best of all of us, and we began to walk in the direction of the blood streaks. These were very different from the splotches we saw on the way here. Instead of the more circular splatters, each bit of the blood trail rolled along the earth in a curving line before stopping, only to resume again a few feet onward. I didn't notice the chirping of birds and animals stop, or the cease and the buzzing of insects. I didn't notice the faint sound of something squishy being torn. My dad must have heard it too when he slipped the rifle off of his shoulder as we all hunkered down and moved as silently as we could. I was the first to see it and, dear God, I was thankful for the brush. Otherwise, I might have seen all of it head on in the daylight. In the distance, through the trees, appeared to be a creature crouched down over something. It was hard to make out through the brush in the distance, but I could distinctly 
see brown black fur or skin in a muzzle. All three of us stopped and watched it in awe and silence. As I looked closer, I thought I could see that the fur only seemed to be in patches on it and there looked to be blood starting to coat areas of it. It leaned over and bit down into something on the ground, which was the deer. I could see a bit of those forked antlers sticking up. I also saw what I thought was a hand raise up, large scythes of claws gleaming on a three-fingered hand before it lowered to dig down and tear more into the meat. I began to feel sick, like I was going to puke up. This thing made those tracks earlier, I, I just knew it. Dad was looking off in the quiet shock while John seemed to finger his camera, debating whether or not to take a picture. It was then that the creature snapped its head up and I caught my first look at gleaming, bloodshot red eyes. It stared directly at us. A screech then emitted from it, high-pitched and grating, like the vibration of the sound was causing part of its inner throat to tear apart. It then launched itself in our direction, still screeching that ghastly sound. My dad rose to his feet and angled the gun, standing as he yelled something to John and me. I assume it was run because John turned and took off. I rose and held my ground as my dad fired off a shot that I knew would miss. Through those trees and with a moving target, he'd be lucky to hit it with a rest, but standing? No chance. The shot did cause the thing to veer off and into the trees toward our right side. And that's when my dad turned and began to run himself. I bolted off with him, my heart jumping into my throat as I ran. I could hear the trees crashing on our right side and then on our left. Could it switch that quickly? That screech emitted once again, and this time, I felt like the terrified deer running through the woods as impending death loomed over me. I don't know how long Dad and I ran for, but enough that I felt my legs start to cramp up and my breath to wheeze. Dad wasn't looking too hot either. He stumbled and gulped in ragged gasps of air. His recent issues must have been finally catching up. Still, he pushed on, and I did with him. I never left his side, even as he slowed, like hell I was going to leave him while that thing was chasing us. I could tell he wanted me to push forward though, to leave him in an escape on my own. My mind went to a joke of my dad used to tell of two campers and one brings running shoes. The other asked why he brought running shoes and if he expected to outrun a bear, his friend answers, no, I just have to outrun you. Well, this wasn't a joke. I don't know how we managed it, but soon the two of us burst into our campsite, gasping and wheezing for air. Dad coughed and moved over to the car, leaning against it with an arm. He coughed and spat up as I bent over and gasped. I looked up to see him still coughing and lurching and I felt my stomach twist. He wasn't, he wasn't doing well. Slowly, I came over and put a hand on his shoulder. Dad? I asked quietly. Are you okay? Yeah, he spoke in a ragged voice in between coughs. Just, I'm okay. Are you okay? Huh. <laughs> Still worried about me when he was the one that looked like he would cough up a lung. I'm alright. I reassured him before I lift my head, but that's when I realized that something as I looked about our solitary campsite. John was nowhere in sight. I stepped away from my dad, my eyes looking around the camp. It looked untouched, just the way we left it this morning. But John wasn't here. I looked back to my father, who seemed to finally recover and push himself away from the car. John's not here, I told him as I looked around. My dad cursed and his gaze wandered back towards the woods, where that same creature had been. My eyes followed him and I swallowed down some of the bacon and eggs that tried to come back up. You think he's out there? You think that thing? We'll find him. My dad cut me off as he drew in a breath. Get some fresh water ready for us and some food. Make sure you got your ammo. He commanded. I didn't question him. I moved and refilled our canteens with water and stuffed some of the quick snack foods we brought with us into small bags. I double checked my ammunition and found my clip still full. I hadn't fired a single shot. Dad moved to the car and pulled out a box of short mag rounds before setting it on the hood. The clip in his rifle came out and he replaced the two shots he fired swiftly before, oddly hesitating as he went to slip the clip back in. Instead, he turned to me and extended the clip out. Here son, 
That'll give you an extra one, he said firmly as I gave him an odd look. Dad, what about you? I asked as I lift my hand to take the full clip from him. He turned back toward the car and reached in again, soon slipping out his old 30 odd 30 rifle. Without a second thought, he began to load it with ammo from an old and beat up 30 odd 30 box he had brought with him. I shook my head and came up next to him. No, Dad, that gun's old, and we're going to need power if we come across that thing. We have a short magnum, Dad. The 3030 is my gun, he replied quickly and curtly. It's reliable. I used this gun for 30 years, and it still shoots like it's brand new. I know it, and it'll be plenty. Besides, you got the short mag. After loading the rounds, he turned and put a hand on my shoulder. We can take care of it. Now are you ready? I looked away from him to those woods, those same woods which before this moment did not seem so dark or ominous. Even in the daylight, the trees seemed to suck up the light like a vampire, leaving shadows where a sickening, patchy, furred monster might be waiting to creep up on us and tear us into pieces. We're going after John, I asked as I kept my gaze focused on that forest, trying to pierce the darkness and hoping I didn't find two bloodshot eyes staring back at me. We're going to get him back. A deep breath and I nodded before slipping the extra clip into my pocket. My hands went to unsling the rifle from my shoulder and I finally looked back to my father. Okay, I spoke, my voice coming out much quieter than it meant to. Let's go. Our search began in late afternoon while the sun seemed like it was in a losing battle of staying high in the sky. Journeying back onto the woods while that thing was still out there terrified me like hell. I had already witnessed it tearing apart that deer and now John was missing too. I secretly hoped he just got lost on the way back and we'd find him trying to get back to the path. I hated to think I was hoping he was just lost but the alternative meant that monster. I forced those thoughts from my head and gripped my rifle tightly. My eyes wandered over to my father as we moved. He stepped swiftly and carefully, eyes looking about him. Every once in a while, he stopped and we would just listen before moving on. I was glad he had that hunting experience. It would really help us out now. Still, I could tell he was nervous. The hands that gripped his trusty gun were gripping too tightly and shaking just a bit. Oh, Dad, I had that same fear in me, too. The sky grew darker, and still we searched. Thankfully, the most I heard and saw were bugs and small animals scurrying around. No creature yet, but that didn't mean it wasn't still out there, just watching and waiting. Suddenly, I saw my father stop and bend down near a large tree. I moved after him carefully and as quietly as I could. He reached down and picked up what looked to be the mangled remains of a DSLR camera. It looked crushed, the body smashed in and the lens broken off. Worst thing was I could see the smears of blood that coated the camera and the neck hanger. I couldn't hold back anymore. I turned and retched. My body fell over as I let loose what remained of bacon and eggs in my stomach, all over the forest ground. My dad didn't say a thing. He just looked down and sighed. We both knew. As I knelt on the ground, trying to recover, I saw my dad rise to his feet and step off through the trees. A few long breaths and I pulled myself up after composing myself before sprinting after him. He walked for a ways, every once in a while glancing down toward the ground and then looking back up. I didn't dare look. I knew what he was following. I just didn't want to believe it. It wasn't long before the smell hit me. That coppery scent of fresh blood stung at my nostrils and I held every breath. No, no, this wasn't it. We're going to find a deer, a bear, uh, well, anything. But not this, though. Not this. I tried to calm myself down. I just lied to myself. We soon found John. My dad tracked the blood smears I refused to look at to a large one splattered against a big tree. He was slumped over in the branches hanging down as drops of blood fell down to the base of the tree, mixing with wood and dirt. I could only look for a moment before I had to turn away, but it was just enough to see the gouge marks running along his arm that hung limply over the branch, 
swaying in the light wind and the bits of flesh and intestine that threatened to spill out with just the slightest movement. My dad grimaced and curled his lip. He just stared up and I could see moisture building in his eyes. He looked from the tree and over to me and I knew what was going through his head. John's dead. My uncle and his brother-in-law is dead. And the two of us were still stuck here with the killer. I was in danger. I knew what he was saying in his head. Dad saw me, hung up in that tree, blood dripping along a lifeless body. He turned away and quickly reached to grab my shoulder. We're leaving, he said so quickly and quietly, it took me a moment to fully understand. Already, he began to drag me through the trees back toward the camp. I moved along lifelessly, in a daze at the recent events. It was getting to be too much. One of us was already dead and we could very well join him soon. I bit back tears and moved faster. I wanted out. I wanted home. I wanted away from this sickening thing. Darkness swiftly poured in and I didn't realize how long we were searching and how quickly night fell upon the area. As the darkness fell, our pace quickened. Soon, it almost felt like we were running again back to camp. My thoughts wandered back to this afternoon. I nearly choked as the fresh memory of that creature screeching and barreling after us rose up in my head. I could almost hear it out there, running along with us through the trees, ready to pounce and rip us to shreds. I let out a sigh of relief when my dad and I slipped back into that camp clearing. He didn't hesitate at all. He took one last look around for John and then moved for the car. What about our stuff? I asked as I came up from behind him, motioning to our gear. We still had our tent, the cooking supplies, the food, and everything else we took just lying about. We don't need it, Dad said as he threw open the car door. It's all replaced, that screech. We don't need it, Dad said as he threw open the car door. It's all replaced, that screech. That screech cut him off. From the side of the car, I saw it. It burst out and reared up. I only saw it up close for a second, but it felt like more. I seemed to have enough time to see every detail. The reason why its brownish black fur looked to be in patches seemed to be because of where parts of its black skin that looked diseased and rotted. It was tall and scrawny, overly scrawny with bones that just out in a way that made them seem like they'd tear through the skin at any moment. It had a canine-like muzzle with jaws that opened into thick and sharp yellowed fangs. It was reared up on thin back legs that ended in an elongated three-toed feet equipped with three long claws that dug into the earth below it. A three-clawed hand rose and smacked my dad in the chin, causing him to be flung back into the ground. The 30 odd 30 rifle fell away from his grasp and landed in the soft dirt just a few feet away from him. The creature then turned to me those blood-red eyes focusing on mine as I looked back into its gaze. My mouth hung open in shock as it snarled down to me, sickly black-colored drool oozing from its jaws. I at least remembered my rifle and brought it up to point the barrel at it. The creature's arm shot out, hand grasping around the barrel and, with strength I didn't think that scrawny form could have, wrenched it out of my grasp and chucked it away from me. I backed up and was about to turn and run when it leapt. I felt a heavy form crash over me, sending my back down into hard dirt. I could smell it as it tackled and held me down, a stench of rotting flesh and dried blood assaulting my nostrils. I'm going to die now. God, I'm dead. That's all I can think of as I saw it raise a clawed hand up. A loud sound echoed suddenly, the sound of something hard smacking into flesh and the creature stumbled off me. I took that moment to turn and crawl away, panting heavily before I risked looking back. I saw my dad standing there, both hands clutched together in front of him after he apparently sent a hard haymaker into the back of the creature. Hell, I didn't know he had that strength left in him. The monster already recovered and rose back up, but this time, hissing and screeching at my father. My dad glanced at me and my breath caught in my throat. He wasn't hoping to beat it, he just wanted to distract it, get it away from me. My dad was going to let it kill him, just to save me. The creature rose and struck out with those claws at dad. It struck him in his arms, leaving those gashes as my father fell backward to the ground. I needed to move. I needed to get up. I needed to run. 
he was going to sacrifice himself for me and all I could do was sit and stare as it happened. I pushed myself up with my arms, eyes locked on the scene before me. My hand brushed against something metal. I looked down to see my father's 30 out 30 lying next to me. The creature then stepped forward and fell over my father, looming over him and pinning him to the ground. I yanked up the gun and readied it in my arms. If you can help it, son, always find something to balance your gun on. Don't ever shoot it just holding it unless you have to. I remember those words. I adjusted my position, sitting down and raising my knees to rest the gun on them like my dad did when shooting that deer. My father yelled something at me and I thought it was run but I couldn't hear it over the sound of the creature hissing. Relax, son. Close one eye and keep focused on your target. I rolled my shoulders, forcing my muscles to relax and close an eye letting the sight focus in on the drooling head of the monster. The monster opened its mouth and screeched in my dad's face, drool oozing out and over my father as my dad shut his eyes and turned away. Now, when you're ready, hold your breath. Don't hold it for too long or you're gonna start shaking just enough. I took in a breath and held it, the gun steadying in my hands as my breathing halted for the moment. The creature's arm rose, claws lifted and ready to flay into my father. This was it. I'd have one chance, and if I missed, my dad would die. Then, slowly squeeze the trigger down like you're milking a cow. My fingers slowly squeezed down on the trigger as I tried my best to imagine what milking a cow must be like. The creature's clawed hand fell downward. The shot rang out and I could hear a sick crunching noise mixed with that of a splatter. The creature howled and lurched off of my dad. Its oversized hands grasping its head in pain. I could see what I thought was blood pouring out of the side of its deformed skull. It jerked around, stumbling on its feet before it turned and snarled at me. Then it turned and took off, running back into the woods. I sat there in silence, panting as sweat poured down my face, and soon, my eyes moved back to my father. He was lying there, not moving. Swiftly, I rose and slid down next to him. Dad? I cried out. Dad, come on! He blinked and stared up at me before his arms rose and wrapped around me in a tight hug. I hugged him back and closed my eyes. We were okay, both of us were okay. Soon my father let go and pushed himself up to his feet. He glanced back towards the wood as a hand rose to wipe some of that foul smelling drool away from his face. I, I. He began with a slight stammer before he lift a hand and placed it on my shoulder. I taught you good. He spoke and I couldn't help but let out a small chuckle. We didn't waste any time. The two of us got into that car and drove. Neither of us said a thing until the car pulled out of that winding, bumpy road and onto solid highway near an hour later. I was the first to break the silence. What do you think it was? I asked quietly as my head turned toward him. I don't know was the only reply I got. What are we gonna say about John? The truth, he was attacked by an animal. We shot it, but we think it got away. He sighed and hung his head. I knew he felt responsible for John, and it wasn't even his fault, though. That thing, it was all that damn thing's fault, and nobody would believe it if we said a monster got him. So an animal, it, it, it just had to be an animal. We were silent for a bit longer before I spoke in a quiet, nervous tone. What if that thing comes back? I asked as my eyes focused on my father. What if it follows you, comes after us again? My dad did something surprising that moment. He smirked. He smirked and shook his head. I'm not scared if it does. That surprised me, and I gave him an odd look like he had finally gone crazy. Dad, that thing took a bullet to the face and you're not scared of it? Son, he began as he glanced at me, a confident look on his face. You shot that thing in the head and it howled and ran away. That means it was hurt. Means it was scared of getting hurt more. And if it's scared of getting hurt more, and that grin on his face grew wider, well, that means we could kill it.
Everyone has their fears, whether they are rational or irrational. Mine has always been dolls. But not all dolls, mainly just the ones that are a bit too human looking. I think it's mainly the eyes that get to me. So, I'm sure you can imagine I was ecstatic to find out that I was of course the inheritor of my very own clown doll. A gift, actually, from my late great aunt. I had met her maybe once or twice in my entire life, so why she left this of all things to me was just beyond me. Now, this doll was something straight from my nightmares. I mean, a doll was bad enough, but then you throw in the clown element as well? The doll's glass-like face was painted white, with red accents and markings over the eyes, mouth, and cheeks. The eyes themselves, however, were nothing but a black void. It has thick white hair jetting out the sides and a round hat that almost resembles a cherry on top. Its outfit is essentially your typical clown attire. Like the face, it was a mixture of red and white. This doll is about the size of a toddler, so way too big for me to feel comfortable anywhere near it. I would have given it away, of course, but out of respect for my grandmother, I kept it. So, naturally, its new home would be my closet. I placed it in the back on top of an old dresser that held clothes that no longer fit me. I thought that would be that, and my life would go on as it always had. Unfortunately, that would not be the case. Now, I'm not exactly a tidy person, so my clothes rarely made it back to my closet. So, I didn't have to see my clown friend for quite a while, actually. It was actually a few weeks, to be exact, uh, before I finally went to my closet on the quest for a clean pair of jeans. And, of course, there he was, you guessed it, sitting on the floor in front of the dresser. Now, I, I just assumed he must have fallen off the dresser somehow, because I clearly remember setting him on top. Those empty black eyes were too much for me though, so I grabbed my jeans quickly and left without bothering to put him back on top. I spent the rest of the day thinking about how that doll could have fallen off the dresser, it just didn't make any sense. So, as a curious person, I decided to check out the closet when I returned home. The doll was there of course, but it was back to its original position, atop the dresser where I had originally put it. I approached it and looked into those empty eyes. Nothing. And as much as I creeped me out, I mean, it was just a doll, right? I must have just imagined seeing it on the floor. I mean, I live alone, so there's no way anyone else could be moving it. Regardless, I decided to stay clear of the closet as much as possible. Now, a couple of nights later, I was awoken to the sound of what seemed to be laughter, and it just had to be coming from my closet. It was very faint, which is why it was a bit surprised it woke me up. I'm generally a very heavy sleeper, so for something like this to wake me up was just odd. The last thing I wanted to do was go to that closet, so I decided to just wait it out. After about 30 seconds, I heard a loud thump noise, and then the laughter just stopped. After turning on every light possible and arming myself with a kitchen knife, I decided it was time to check out the closet. As I slowly opened the door and I was completely normal, absolutely nothing was out of place. Even the doll was sat upon his normal spot on top of the dresser. I picked up the doll and felt around to see if there was any sort of speech box, but there wasn't. With a loud sigh, I set the clown back down and left my closet. Perhaps I was just finally losing it. Over the next couple days, I was on high alert. I began to notice small things here and there went missing or were removed. Most notably, small bits of food that I swear I had never eaten. I relentlessly searched every nook and cranny of my small house looking for any possible signs of vermin or any other intruders, but nothing just made sense everywhere except the closet, of course. Of course, my searches turned up nothing, further confirming my idea that I was in fact going crazy. That was until a couple of nights later, the laughing returned. Only this wasn't just faint laughter, this was a booming cackle. The laugh seemed to reverberate through my whole house. I was petrified, I didn't dare move an inch from my bed. 
I began to hear loud banging noises coming from my closet as the laughing persisted, until suddenly my closet door swung open. A large, dark figure emerged and stormed out of my room. I heard it sprint through my house, opening my front door and leaving, and as soon as this happened, the laughter stopped. After reminding myself just to breathe, I was finally able to move from my bed. I approached the closet. What I found devastated me. My old dresser was no longer against the wall. Instead, it was now in the middle of my closet, and where the dresser had been was a hole. A hole easily large enough for a human to fit behind, but small enough that you would never notice it if it was being covered up. Besides the hole was the doll, sat perfectly up with one arm outstretched towards the hole. I didn't dare look into the hole, afraid of what I might find. Instead, I grabbed the doll and locked myself in my car as I called 911. The police later confirmed my suspicions of what had happened. Someone had been living in my home. Inside the hole was a pallet where the person had been sleeping, as well as a small amount of trash. But the worst of all was that the person had a small collection of pocket knives. Probably not meant as weapons, but it's still not exactly comforting to, to be thinking about it. Since that night, my clown friend has not left my room. He now has his own special perch on the table next to my bed. I'm still not a huge fan of dolls, but perhaps they aren't so bad after all. <laughs>